did you grow up with three foot tall speakers in your living room? I know it wasn't just me. <laughs> My dad was so proud of those speakers. Since then, there has been a whole lot of advancement in the world of speaker technology. And not just in size, but also in sound pressure levels, frequency response, and cone materials. But what else should we consider when choosing a speaker for our next design? With all of the many options out there, making sure that you've checked all the right boxes for that speaker can be a bit daunting. And that's where we come in. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Nick Griloni from Same Sky and I explore the characteristics of speakers in audio design and the parameters you should consider when choosing a speaker. We also investigate the roles that sound pressure levels and frequency response play in the selection of a speaker and how Same Sky can help you find the best speaker for your next design. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Same Sky. Hi, Nick. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Okay, so Nick, we're talking all about speakers in audio design today. But before we get started, what all will we be covering today? Today we'll be covering a few topics. We're going to start with a short overview of speakers. Then I'm going to go more into detail about good speaker selection practices. Following this, I'll go over our product offerings. And then we'll finish off with some additional resources. Fantastic. Now, Nick, before we dive in, give me a quick review of the anatomy of a speaker. Yeah, of course. Starting from the bottom to the top, on the bottom, we have the PCB. This most often only facilitates routing from the terminals to the voice coil. After this, we have a frame and yoke. These provide a rigid structure to contain the assembly and allow mounting. Right above this, we have the magnet. This is a permanent magnet that provides a magnetic field for the voice coil to interact with. Sitting above this, we have the plate. This is used to help direct the magnetic flux towards the coil. The voice coil is where your electrical signal goes. The alternating current that's fed into the system generates a magnetic field that interacts with the magnetic field of the permanent magnet. And then here at the top, we have the cone. This is adhered to the voice coil and acts to transfer the kinetic energy generated by the speaker assembly to generate sound pressure waves that we perceive as sound. To have a good understanding of the characteristics of a speaker, it's important to know how they're characterized. We use audio analyzers to capture all the acoustic characteristics and some of the electrical characteristics of a speaker. The primary point of importance here is it's very critical to be aware of the conditions in which a speaker are characterized, namely two details, the baffle configuration and the distance between the speaker and the microphone. Another key point to keep in mind is most speakers that are placed in applications are tested in an open baffle configuration and then are placed in one box of one form or another. This forms a resonance chamber that changes the performance of the speaker. All right, Nick, let's also talk about the parameters to consider when choosing a speaker. The most important parameter I think we can all agree is the sound pressure level. We measure sound pressure level in decibels. The logarithmic nature of the scale can sometimes be hard to conceptualize for sound levels. Comfortable listening levels are generally considered to be between 60 and 95 decibels at one meter. To put this in a real world example, that's anywhere from the loudness of a loud talker such as myself or a busy city intersection. Even so, it's common for me to receive requests for very high SPL speakers that are in reality much more powerful than what is needed. When I receive such a request, I always encourage taking a step back to consider the noise level of the environment that the speaker is expected to perform in. A speaker that is six decibels louder than the environmental noise level will be clearly audible to the user. 
some other important considerations to factor in. How close will the typical user be to the speaker and how far away should they be able to hear it? These are all important factors to consider when determining a target SPL. Nick, what about frequency? What do we need to consider here? The SPL that's listed in the specification on a data sheet is often just a singular data point. The frequency response of the speaker is a much more detailed characterization of the SPLs that a speaker can produce. In theory, an ideal speaker would have a perfectly flat frequency response. When selecting a speaker, it's important to understand what media will be played on it. Selecting a speaker that performs well in the most utilized frequency range will lead to better results. Another characteristic I would like to highlight here is the roll-off into the base frequencies. The left edge of this plateau is what we refer to as the resonant frequency. The resonant frequency is the frequency that a speaker is most efficiently able to produce. It could be identified by this edge here in the frequency response. Any frequency below this point will have a greater amount of distortion. So, Nick, what about impedance? Why do we need to consider this aspect? The key consideration here is it's important to match the impedance of the speaker to that of the amplifier. Even so, in some cases, it's okay to use a speaker with a higher impedance than what the amplifier is rated for. In reality, the rated impedance of the amplifier is a minimum. It's okay to use a speaker with a higher impedance, but you might experience some sound loss. I know that distortion can play a role here as well. So what kind of issues can distortion cause? Sound distortion is the deviation between the received signal and the reproduced sound. This can affect the quality of the sound that the speaker produces. One form of distortion that we've already somewhat covered is linear distortion. This refers to the distortion of the frequency response. This distortion will result in some frequencies being louder than others. There's also harmonic distortion, often parameterized as total harmonic distortion, or THD. Harmonic distortion refers to the sound artifacts that occur at frequencies that are a multiple of the received signal. This can result in a fuzzy sound quality at low levels and a garbled quality at high levels. Nick, how do we define what level of THD is acceptable? The acceptable level of THD really depends on the media that's being played. A general recommendation that's often given is to have a THD level that's below 5%. This, again, really depends on the media. Media that utilizes distortion will be less impacted, for example, rock or metal music, whereas the clean bass of, say, polka music will be impacted the most. In this situation, it would be best to choose a speaker with a low resonant frequency. If a speaker that can cover the entire perceivable frequency range is needed, a crossover system can be used to mitigate some of the harmonic distortion. Nick, there's a big movement towards smaller and smaller speakers these days. So how do we contend with this trend toward miniaturization? Yeah, there have been more recent advances in audio design that allow small devices to make high SPL sound. On the right, you could see a great example of a speaker and rear closure assembly. This combination allows the speaker to be shaped to fit inside of an application, whereas a more traditional design would require the application to accommodate the shape of the speaker. An important note I'd like to add here is that many high SPL miniature speakers require a rear enclosure to operate. This requirement is often listed in the data sheet underneath the specification section. So, Nick, we also need to talk about the materials that the cones are made out of as well, right? The material composition of the cones play a key importance in the quality of a speaker. Up at the top, we have plastics, which is by far the most commonly used material in speakers. Plastic cones offer some great benefits. They're moisture-resistant, cost-effective, and they're very moldable. But they have a few drawbacks. 
They have limited clarity and a high amount of resonance. Going down the list, we have cloth. It has its own drawbacks. Unlike plastics, it is moisture sensitive and it's limited to moderate power handling. Paper cones are also an option. They're cost effective. They offer low resonance and produce warm tones or warm sound quality. Much like cloth, they're also highly sensitive to moisture and they're not the most durable option. Last on the list, we have aluminum. Aluminum has a lot of benefits. It's lightweight, durable, responsive, and moisture resistant. But unlike most of the other options on here, it has limited damping and it's moderately expensive. Another important note here is that you don't always see one of these options placed in a speaker. Many of these can be used in combination with one another to balance out the sound quality of a speaker. Are there any other issues or options we should keep in mind? Yeah, one last topic I'd like to touch on is our IP rated options. I won't go too in depth into this topic, but there are a few key takeaways. Some IP rated options can hold a higher cost due to the additional and more expensive materials that are required to prevent ingress. Another important factor is that the IP rating only applies to the face of the speaker. Protecting the rest of the speaker is left up to the engineer's design. Here at Same Sky, we offer a variety of IP rated speakers to meet the needs of your application. Nick, talk to me about the different kinds of speakers that Same Sky offers. I'd love to. At Same Sky, we categorize our speakers into four categories. We have our standard speaker options. These are going to be speakers that are over 40 millimeters in length or width. We also offer a wide selection of miniature speakers. These range in size anywhere from about 10 to 40 millimeters in size. We also have a few specialized categories of speakers. We have tweeters that are excellent at performing at higher frequencies. And we also have receivers. These are commonly seen in headphones or headsets and are meant to be used when pressed against the ear. Nick, how would my audience find the best speaker for their application? On our website, we have an excellent parametric search engine. This is really useful in narrowing down a speaker that's right for your application. What if I need some kind of customized speaker? Could Same Sky also help me here? Certainly. While most applications can be covered with standard offerings or standard offerings with slight modifications, there are times when you need to go non-standard and, and we're here to help. We pride ourselves in offering solutions to customers with smaller EAUs compared to many of our competitors. These services include size and height adjustments, modifying the wires and connectors that are attached to a speaker, altering the cone materials used, designing rear enclosures that work with the speaker to produce the best sound. And we're also able to help tune the specific parameters of a speaker to make it a great fit. So Nick, talk to me about the further audio design services that Same Sky offers. Beyond our custom manufacturing capabilities, we can assist in the design and development process. We offer audio simulation services, consulting, and we also are able to test and validate these designs. So Nick, what kind of supporting assets does Same Sky offer for these kinds of designs? Our marketing team here at Same Sky has put in some great work to make sure our resources are available when you need them. Using our website, you have the ability to check our current stock with our authorized distributors. You could get in contact with a sales representative near you. Most of our speaker options have 3D models available, and we can supply one upon request. We also have our Same Sky blog that covers a variety of helpful topics, many of which address speakers. Beyond our blog, we have videos, ebooks, calculators, and more to guide you in your speaker selection process. Speaking of calculators, 
we have two great calculators that I frequently use available on our website. On the left, you could see our speaker power calculator. This is really a multi-tool calculator for various common conversions and calculations that are useful when selecting a speaker. On the right, you can see our SPL calculator. This is for converting sound levels to various distances and power levels. All right, Nick, so before we go, can you recap your main points for me? Yeah, really the big takeaway here is speakers are more than just a sound pressure level rating. Many engineers focus on this rudimentary specification when searching for the right speaker, but taking all the factors discussed today can expedite the process in making the right choice. And we're here to help and deliver the resources you need. Fantastic. Well, Nick, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you again for having me. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Same Sky. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talk section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.